Hello, thank you so much for joining me today for Give Him 15, doing a series on taking out giants. I encourage you, if you haven't seen the first post on this series, to go back and look at it. And uh, most of it's coming from, well, a lot of it's coming from this little book called Giants Will Fall. Uh, but I'm adapting a good bit of it, actually, to be appropriate for what God is saying to us right now. And the title of today's post is The Cause. He stood as a titan on the battlefield, his intimidating presence mortifying the ranks of the armies of Israel. According to one translation of scripture, Goliath was, quote, the shock trooper, end quote. This giant would have made the average NBA player look like a preschooler standing six cubits and a span, somewhere near nine and a half feet tall. Goliath must have appeared surreal to the Israelites. Shocking was no doubt an appropriate term to describe him. Twice each day, 80 times in all, this gargantuan Philistine stood before them and cursed the God of Israel causing the Israelite soldiers to cower in fear at his terrifying challenge, send out a man to fight me. He was confident, intimidating, relentless. To David, the young shepherd boy, however, the fact that no one had accepted Goliath's challenge was even more shocking than the giant's menacing size. After all, Greater things were at stake than just this one battle. The Philistines, Israel's arch enemies, were determined to conquer the people of God and eradicate them from the land. David knew that Goliath's challenge was winner take all. David saw beyond Goliath's size and daunting intimidation. He knew something bigger was at stake. Perhaps this is what young David was implying with the question, is there not a cause? When he announced he was going to face this giant, what a probing question. David's question implied there are some things more important than our individual lives. Our decisions shouldn't be made based on how terrifying, imposing, or indestructible this giant seems. There is a cause far bigger and far more important than the potential cost of facing this menacing giant. What was this cause David spoke of? And uh, some of them should sound familiar. The well-being of Israel's wives and children hung in the balance. Homes and possessions were on the line. The blood that had been shed by others to purchase their freedom was about to be trampled underfoot. Israel's freedom was at stake. The very purposes of God through his covenant with Abraham were in jeopardy. That last statement is loaded with significance. Goliath's challenge was about so much more than simply one nation fighting another. It concerned more than just a squabble over a few square miles of dirt. The freedoms and destiny of one nation, although very significant, cannot compare to the greater cause hidden in this drama, the very purposes of God on the earth were at stake. God's covenant with Abraham had been initiated in order to establish a messianic lineage, an entry point for he himself to enter earth's fallen race and redeem the world. And this divine cause was in jeopardy. No wonder Satan was fighting Israel so fervently through this demonized giant. An eternity for billions of people was at stake. Companionship for Father God and a bride for his son were on the line. 
the integrity and vindication of Yahweh, who promised to redeem fallen humanity, were at risk. And the recompense due Satan, the destroyer, also hung in the balance. Indeed, there was a cause. Satan didn't know how God planned to do all of this, but he knew it involved the seed of Abraham. Was David aware of all this? Not fully, but he certainly realized this was about more than simply the well-being of Israel. God, the text tells us, was being taunted. Goliath cursed David by his gods, revealing to us the deeper and more subtle plot unfolding on this ancient battlefield. It was a battle between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. Thinking of this greater cause, David, lover of God, responded with this goal in fighting the giant, the following goal in fighting the giant. He said that all the earth may know there is a God in Israel and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Clearly, David understood that a cause greater than the survival of his nation was at stake, a noteworthy cause worth fighting and, if necessary, dying for. And fight David did, killing the shock trooper and removing his head. History was made. The cause was saved and Israel's destiny protected. Such is the role of destiny-driven, cause-minded people, preserving causes and writing history. America's destiny, like Israel of old, is being challenged. Today's Goliaths have made their stand and issued their challenge. Spiritual giants are trying to abort our destiny and in doing so, frustrate the plans of God around the world. Anyone who cannot discern that the war against America's identity, as well as other conflicts in the earth currently, has no discernment. God is calling cause-minded warriors who perceive the situation in America clearly enough and believe in the cause passionately enough to become history-making, destiny-preserving giant killers. I hope you're one of them. Today's war for America has already begun, and the opening volley was fired in the 60s, though our battle is certainly of a different nature. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. It is no less real and will be no less intense. And most certainly, as was the case in America's revolution and in Israel's battle with Goliath, the destiny of our nation and the purposes of God on earth are at stake. In this war, the eternal destinies of souls are at stake. Is there another great generation of spiritual soldiers who will storm our Normandy, the gates of hell, and lay it all on the line for a righteous cause? Is not our eternal cause just as noble as was the cause of America's soldiers and heroes down through history? Just as it was in David's day, God's reputation is certainly part of our cause. Is he not taunted daily in our land and cursed in the name of false gods? Are not his words and laws mocked? In the past, America, more than any other nation, has been known as an example of what it means to be a Christian nation. Our sin, however, now mocks and reproaches him while presenting a false picture of what a nation under God should look like. Our government leaders mock him. Our educators and media mock him. Our motto 
in God we trust is currently no more than a faith-filled statement of hope clung to by a remnant determined to make it a national reality once again. For those who know and love him, this should be one of our motivating causes. Am I being overly dramatic in making such shocking comparisons and assertions? Come on, Sheets, I can almost hear some thinking. Is America's destiny really at stake? Is the eternal well-being of billions of people actually hanging in the balance? Is God being mocked? Are we that far from what our founding fathers intended? Without a doubt. But there is good news. As leaders take counsel against him, Psalm 2, the terrifying laugh of Yahweh is ringing in the heavens. Also, Psalm 2, the ruler over all the earth is reminding us of his promise to his son, I will give you the nations as your inheritance. My rod of iron is still strong and is about to be extended, he says. A generation of passionate patriots are arising who, like David of old, believe enough in the cause of Christ to risk everything for his cause. Greatness is being restored, not at a political level, but a heart level. Greatness is found when godly character and courage overcome giant-sized challenges, no matter the cost. When Lewis Morris of New York was about to sign the Declaration of Independence, his brother advised against it, warning he would lose all his property. Morris, a plain-spoken founding father, responded, Damn the consequences. Give me the pen. That is greatness. Morris displayed the heart of a cause-minded David staring down the mocking Goliath of his day. We must do the same. Our giants, our socialism, humanism, liberalism, out-of-control government, abortion, immorality, drugs, breakdown of the family, materialism, love of pleasure, human trafficking, fatherlessness. Make your own list. But without question, God is raising up a generation of Lewis Morris's warriors who will stand up, accept the challenge, take hold of their pens or five smooth stones and write history. America will find her heroes. Giants will fall. Revival will explode, and the cause of Christ will be accomplished. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father, you said, when you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. Through the rivers, they won't overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you won't be scorched, nor will a flame burn you. We lay hold of your promise today. You told us to be bold and courageous. You commanded us not to fear. We refuse to cower in the face of today's Goliaths. You have said that in this era, giants will fall. Principalities will be removed from places they have ruled for centuries. Your gospel will go forth with power bring forth abundant fruit. We hold fast to these promises. We know there is more at stake than just our freedoms and prosperity. The redemption of a billion souls is at stake. Let your rod of authority descend on those who oppose you. We pray that they kiss the sun as the psalm goes on to say, but if they refuse, crush their influence and rule. We ask you to restore greatness to this nation 
in order that we might partner with you once again. Awaken the church to this incredible privilege. Greatness is not measured by wealth or power. Greatness is measured in the heart. Give us hearts of love, faith, boldness, and loyalty. Give us leaders with integrity, with character, and yes, with common sense. And give us a billion souls. Amen. And our decree. The Ecclesia decrees that the cause of Christ will prosper and succeed. Giants will fall. Principalities will lose their hold. And the harvest will come in. Amen. Thank you for joining me. And I'll see you tomorrow.